worse. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost as bad as collecting birds, you know. Like, oh my gosh. <laughs> but in this world, the herpers go out and the first thing they grab is a cow. And the second thing they, they grab is a dog, and then a kitten, and then a horse, and then a lamb, and then a burrow, and then a pig, and then a rabbit, and then a person. <laughs> so first conclusion from this is that we have really bad herpetologists. But second conclusion is, if they went out and got another 50 samples, we have no reason to believe that they wouldn't keep accumulating species. But here, we really have no evidence that there are more than two species in this biota. Comment, Dave. Well, I was going to say, you got the, I wonder if the other is the um, search, search image bias. Ah, uh, you know. thank you. Yeah. So this just like cute and cuddly things. Okay, well, I, I was going to be a little bit more relevant than that. So it could be that our herpers like cute and cuddly things. Also could be. Um, but the point that I was going to take home from, from Dave's comment is that each of us is able to sample within our realm of knowledge. So it may be that um, I go out in Corrup sampling the bird fauna, not knowing the songs. And so I would accumulate my species either very slowly, or I might even reach an asymptote and conclude that I'm done, like here. But somebody who knows those bird songs really well and has years of experience in Central Africa, that person may go out and say, oh, Talon, you missed these five species that have very quiet songs or that only sing on the 14th of February or that only sing between three and four in the morning. And because I don't know that fauna, I detect fewer species. In the case of the herpers, maybe they don't know that there is a lizard species that lives only under the bark of one species of tree. And so, the other thing is that an inventory is relative to a place at a point in time, but also to a team of observers. And the expert will probably get up to a higher number than the beginner. Okay, so remember this, because this really tells you everything we're gonna do with inventory completeness. You, you basically jumped to the end of this lecture and got to the conclusion. The conclusion is that as long as you're accumulating new taxa in successive samples, you're probably not done. And when you stop accumulating new taxa in successive samples, you're probably done. And so I'm going to show you a couple different ways that biodiversity scientists have made that decision between done or not done or how done are you. Uh, but really, you've gotten the qualitative message. Okay, so let's go into some different levels of detail. Um, we could just go out and uh, accumulate species records. Okay, and this is probably what I would have to do in Corrup. You know, ideally, I would go to chimpanzee camp and I would live there for a year or so. Okay? And living there, day by day, I'm going to learn new species, I'm going to walk different trails, I'm going to have new experiences, and each day I'm probably going to find a few more species. Okay? But <coughs> notice the second level is a presence-absence matrix. 
A presence absence matrix is a little bit different because in that first level, I was just recording presences. But if I know my fauna well enough, or if I have some reference set, then I can start asking, well, is this species not present because I haven't recorded it yet? Or is this species not present because it's not there? And so a reference set, what's that? Maybe it's a list of <clears throat> the birds or the herbs or the plants of Cameroon. Or maybe it's a list from some well-sampled site nearby. Or maybe it's a list of the birds of the world. Okay? So whatever your reference set is, it may just be, you know, my deep knowledge, which I don't have, of the birds of Corrup National Park. And I'm going to be thinking, you know, that hornbill should be here. Why am I not seeing it? Okay? And so there's a point where your experience is deep enough and your sampling is detailed enough that you may be able to get a matrix that includes information on absences. Thanks, Kate. And then at the end, kind of the maximum level would be if I could in include kind of more detailed information about populations. And I've already expressed to you a lot of concern about that, but I just want you to know that's kind of another level. One, the population data are time expensive to get, and you'll, the botany guys on this next week will be suffering through that, right? Moses walks into one of those quadrats, and he will know what the set of plant species that is there pretty quickly. But then Moses will want measurements and, and descriptions of each of those individuals. That'll get him this matrix of samples and abundances, but the cost will be a lot of uh, time. And for bird people, we like, or they, some bird people like these point counts. And they're really nice in that they give you abundance information, but they're not so nice because they give you abundance information that's mixed up with detectability. Okay, the bird that goes pssst, pssst, versus the bird that goes whoosh, 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 whoosh. Okay, a little bit different to detect. So, while you could say that that is, you know, kind of the best information, you have to be careful that it doesn't eat up all of your time getting it, or that it doesn't give you false precision in those nice estimates of abundance. So yeah, more information is better. Simpler can be better when more information can be confusing. Um, this is what I just said to you. Abundances can be falsely precise. Many times, to be really honest, the detail that is possible, essentially going from here up to here, is determined by practicalities, and you really don't have a choice. Okay, let's start talking about what's easy and what's hard. Remember, I'm leading up to how do we describe our inventories quantitatively, right? Easiest communities will be the ones that have fairly even abundances. Okay, I'm going to give you examples of these later. So when you have a lot of species that are all kind of common, kind of rare, those communities will be the easiest ones to analyze and the easiest ones to get up to completeness on. Obviously, when you have a lot of data, it's better than when you have a little data. 
But do remember that communities with a lot of rare species will be particularly hard to, uh, to characterize. And they don't necessarily have to be rare species in the sense of, you know, endangered or something like that. It may just be that in the dry season or you know, in Korup National Park, when the rains haven't started yet, it may be that amphibians are going to be present in low numbers, very sparse, and they're not going to have a lot of records. So notice we were kind of falling into two of these categories. And so at the end of the day, or at the end of the week, the herp guys may be much more happy with their, herp in with their reptile inventory than with their amphibian inventory. And they're both kind of doing this. We yeah. out. OK. What are the ingredients? There's one ingredient. Daily lists. OK? If you use just your specimens, you're throwing away all of the information that you gathered you know, on the snake that got away, on the frog that you heard singing up in the, or calling up in the, in the canopy, you know, all the other information. Or maybe you collected your specimens of frog species A on this night and this night, but you were hearing it every night, okay? So all you need, essentially these, these, um, these statistics are built strictly around a list of species and their detections in different units of effort, which usually is units of time. Okay, that's kind of a preamble. Anybody have any questions about what I've said so far? Yes. Hold on. Kate sometimes ends up all wrapped up in the wires. So I just, I just was hoping <coughs> to clarify. I mean, this is this da making of daily lists is something that birders do in the afternoon before dinner and then going to bed. Yeah. Um, but uh, when the sampling effort is stretched out across, you know, into 2 a.m. or something like that, are you, I mean, are you really advocating that this whole group of six or eight herpers wake up the next morning and do their, their day list from the day before, including all that diversity? I, I would say find Some a strategic time. time. You know, is it lunchtime? Are you guys always in camp at lunch pretty much? You know, just find something that works. But the important thing is to get on a schedule and stick to it. You know, that's at least taking the time intervals and making them um, consistent. consistent. And also kind of minimizing how much you actually have to memorize. And I mean, I get to, if I forget the daily list one night, it's hard for me to sort out, what did I, what did I see this morning versus yesterday morning? And the funny thing is, is it's harder for the common species because the, the rare species you kind of remark sure. more. Boy, I wish that uh, herpetologists had started doing this 30 years ago, like birders do. We kind of have an organism that lends itself much better to, to that. But yeah, the data would be much richer. And, and this, is, this is not necessarily something that ornithologists do so, ma so much as something that the people who have done enough of this sort of analysis realize, oh, I need this information. And so a lot of people just have it like scribbled in their field notes. And I've seen people say, oh yeah, I mean, I, I see that species every day. Oops, you just fabricated data, yeah, right? right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's not universal in the bird world. Okay. And I've had people get pretty upset at me about doing the daily list, you know just because I'm not skinning birds that half hour. Gotcha. You know.